growing, growing, growing up, going to school, I never really uh, uh, saw people like me in, 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 in academia. One of the things I resolved very early on in life is to be able to give back to the disability community because I found that many people doing disability research are not necessarily like disabled. I'm Joyita Gupta. And this is The Pulse. We know that the disability community isn't a monolith. We also know that the lives of racialized people with disabilities are structured by race, socioeconomic status, and of course, ability. While there is no shortage of personal accounts, each story more compelling than the last, there is still very little research and policy work on the lived experience of people with disabilities who are also people of color. Research is important. It often forms the backbone of policy decisions and funding distribution. So it is imperative that research into the disability community of color remains accountable and grassroots. Today, we discuss the research aspect of being black and disabled. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. I'm Joyita Gupta, joining you from Accessible Media Studios in Toronto. I'm sitting against a black background and it, there are some multicolored squares behind me that's making up the background. And I am in a really comfy, cozy blue sweater, uh, which is zipped has a zipped uh, uh, down the front. And my hair is, as always, pulled back into a ponytail. I'm trying to bring you a couple of Canadian voices and perspectives on being black and disabled in Canada. Last week, I was really delighted to have as my guest, Tina Opalake, and I hope you have a chance to listen to that conversation. Tina is the co-founder of Prosthetics for Foreign Donations, and she talked about her charitable work, but she's also an absolutely outstanding spoken word artist. And I'm a big fan of spoken word. It's like I don't know, painting with your voice. It's poetry onto itself. It's such a beautiful art form that if you only have two minutes to spare and you want to spend two minutes listening to Tina Opalake's interview, I would go to the very end of that conversation and check out her spoken word piece because it was absolutely mind-blowing. And so I'm really pleased as well because we have a terrific guest today, Delorence Lamptey. Delorence is the inaugural Embark Scholar at the Holland Bloorview Rehab Center. He talks about some of his research at Holland Bloorview. He intends to establish READ, or the Race, Ethnicity, and Disability Lab. Lawrence, DeLawrence also reflects on some of his previous research and why it is so important to have research that centers not only disability, but also race, looking at why those intersections matter, not only in research, but for the communities that the research is meant to serve. DeLawrence makes a powerful case for remaining accountable to the people at the grassroots. And I am delighted to welcome DeLawrence to the program. DeLawrence, hello and welcome to The Pulse. I'm so glad you could speak to us today. Uh, thank you so much, Waita. I'm really happy to be on your show. And I hope we would have a very good conversation today. Oh, I, I guarantee it'll be a great conversation. DeLawrence, tell me a little bit about what your role is as the inaugural Embark Scholar. What is that program all about and what is it that you're going to be doing? Yeah, so uh, traditionally, uh, a lot of Black scholars with disabilities like myself has always faced challenges in uh, progressing in the academic career. And the Embark uh, program was developed by the Holland Lovey Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in collaboration with the Black Network, uh, Black Scientist Network at the University of Toronto to be able to uh, bridge that gap and then support Black scholars like myself to uh, help us uh, advance in our careers in our child with disabilities. I hope you don't mind me asking you a very personal question right off the top. 
But you said that black scholars with disabilities face additional barriers that I, I will extend the point a little bit and say that scholars who are disabled but maybe who aren't black don't face and certainly scholars who are able-bodied and white don't face some of those same challenges. What are some of the barriers that you faced in your journey as an uh, academic? Yeah, as uh, some of the barriers have faced in my uh, um, journey, uh, it's very complex because one, I'm black. And then secondly, I'm also uh, disabled. And like these barriers like are emotionally tough to describe. Uh, so what I've learned is to just be emotionally strong, focus on the positives and then see the lights uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. That's that's a really good point because it can take a toll on you having to navigate the system, being both black and disabled. Now that you have this opportunity as the inaugural Embark Scholar, what are you hoping to do in your in your new role? Yeah, so my ultimate aim in, uh, in this new role is to establish the uh, race, ethnicity, and uh, disability lab. Uh, the acronym is Read Lab in order to mobilize uh, students, researchers, and community partners to advance uh, uh, research in this area that is needed to inform policy and practice to uh, improve upon the well-being of uh, racialized children and youth with disabilities in Canada and across mm. the world. How much research is there on the experiences of racialized children with disabilities? Is there a lot of research out there that hasn't been collected or collated in one place? Or is there, in fact, an absence of research into this community? Yeah, so in, in Canada, uh, research in this area is very lacking. And a systematic review that was uh, uh, conducted by uh, some of the researchers at uh, On Unblow View, led by Dr. Salin Lindsay, shows that like research like in this area in itself is lacking uh, not just in Canada but mm -hmm. uh, in many places of the world. Um, I couldn't have but notice that a lot of your research goes back to is, is based in Guyana and you're looking at interactions within the healthcare system and um, you know how people with intellectual disabilities are treated in Guyana. How would you say some of that research um, applies to Canada. Are the contexts so different between Canada and Guyana that the research doesn't really translate over? Or are there commonalities that you've found? There are both differences and some similarities. And I, I can give you an example of like either side of the coin. So uh, first, when we talk about similarities, like people with disabilities uh, all over the world have like faced uh, uh, attitudinal barriers and systemic barriers. But in terms of how like these barriers manifest specifically may be different across uh, cultures and context. So uh, in Ghana, uh, many people with disabilities like uh, face cultural like barriers in terms of uh, cultural explanations of uh, disabilities. So some culture, uh, some people in Ghana believe that uh, disability is um, as a result of uh, uh, the that some people believe that the cause of disability uh, is linked to uh, spiritual and religious like purposes. And so for that matter, uh, people with dis uh, uh, disabilities are discriminated against, uh, are discriminated against in, in, in that context. Uh, whereas in Canada, like people don't necessarily believe that, or many people don't believe that like disability may be linked uh, to um, to these uh, to these spiritual and religious uh, uh, causes, but then people with disability also go through uh, systematic uh, barriers in terms of like uh, difficulties in assessing services and support uh, to be able to improve upon their lives. And it's very interesting that uh, for many. Uh, Canadians who see me as a black person and as a black immigrant from uh, can uh, from Ghana with a PhD, most of, most of the time, the first question they ask me is that, well, there must be a lot of resources uh, in Ghana to be able to support you to 
you uh, go through go through your education and then um have a phd because not a lot of canadians with disabilities uh are able to have uh like get their phds or even go through uh post secondary education and one of the uh, w- one of the things i i tell them is that well i hear you and i'm not here to uh compare between like which country has got the uh better resources or not because like everybody's experience is very unique and different but what i hear from uh what you are saying is that perhaps canada is not doing enough to support people with disabilities to be able to advance in um in their education uh, careers mhm that makes a lot of sense delorens what led you on your journey as a researcher and as an academic you're a smart guy you could have done anything uh what is it about research and and being a scientist that attracts you and makes you feel that this is something that adds meaning to your life yeah so uh i have done a lot of things i i was born with disability uh like in ghana so i have right sided weaknesses so uh paralysis linked to cerebral palsy so i can't use my uh right hand and then i walk with with a limp and going going growing up going to school i never really uh uh saw people like me in 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 academia one of the things i resolved very early on in life is to be able to give back to the disability community because i found that many people doing disability research are not necessarily like disabled so i wanted to be part of it and i have done a lot of things i have been a, a clinical psychologist um supporting uh, children and youth with disabilities in in ghana i have also like yeah, when i was in ghana i have also uh, served as a special educational like education like teacher to give back to the disability community and then i also thought that like research would be like another tool that i could use to uh promote the lives of people with disabilities even in canada here i have served as the disability inclusive uh development specialist for uh a non for profit organization that like helps uh support uh kids and youth with disabilities and their families uh across africa and uh, other low in middle income countries across the world. Mhm. Yeah. In the last 10-15 years of you your of your research, you've done extensive research on a variety of topics ranging from as I said interactions in the healthcare system, looking at um early childhood education. There was a fascinating study about um the impact of uh college and university transition programs. Uh there was this great one about the impact of pedestrian and transit training for people with disabilities. given the wide scope of the research you've done was there anything there that really took you by surprise yeah uh, w- one of the big things that like uh took me by surprise was that like a lot of the research don't really collect uh, racialized like data so uh for example with the sample they would collect uh let's say age uh whether the uh the the the, the participants were like female or male or gender diverse but um there is limited research in terms of uh whether the participants were white how many participants were white how many participants were uh aboriginals and how many participants were uh would co- consider themselves as like visible minorities and when i say visible minorities is a term that's generally used by the government of canada to refer to um uh black people uh chinese people and um like people of color uh b- b- basically so that was really like i was very fascinated because i'm a black person with disabilities and i asked myself that well this research this research may be good but then to what extent are people like me or people with color like as included in the sample uh whether they are included or not we can't tell based on the publications so 
And if I cannot tell as a researcher, then what it means is that uh, there may be policy work, uh, policy makers or service providers may not be able to tell who uh, may not be. Uh, so there may be, uh, let me say it again. So that if I'm not able to tell as a researcher, then in, it's likely that like uh, policy makers or uh, service providers uh, may also not be able to tell how many uh, people of color were, were included in like in this research because we don't have that information. And that has got implications because uh, what it means is that it's going, uh, people may not be able to uh, uh, design uh, policies or programs that may effectively address the needs of uh, racialized people like myself. So I decided that, well, I need to be able to um, uh, kind of uh, lead a, a, a research that will specifically address this mm -hmm. gap in the literature. Dolores, why do you think this gap exists? Why is there a reluctance to openly talk about race or ask about race when we're conducting studies and doing research? Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's it's very complex. There are so many reasons why like this gaps may like exist. It's possible that uh, researchers may not have uh, may, may may not be may not have been that interested in 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 kind of uh, collecting uh, racialized uh, like race data as part of uh, their demographic uh, characteristics when they uh, uh, when they collect uh, racist data, and then it's also uh, it's also possible that. Uh, many uh, racialized people uh, may not want to participate uh, in research because um, the person who is collecting the data is actually like a like a white person who is not like who doesn't like they don't really identify with. And given the his like historical like tension between like uh, like racialized people and non racialized people, it's very difficult for. It can be very difficult for many racialized people to actually open up to uh, somebody who is not like them. So I think that like the process of data collection too is like it can be like a factor. And I feel that like when somebody like me, a racialized person uh, who is black, uh, like approach another black person to kind of explain my research and to kind of uh, help them uh let them know that like the research is to help uh the community they are more likely to open up to me and give me the data uh, that i need uh uh to 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 uh that the, the information that i need to or let me put it this way so when people like me who is black uh, approach them to collaborate with them to do research with them they are more likely to open up uh, and to uh, collaborate with me compared to uh, somebody who may not uh, mm. uh, be white. You make such a great yeah. point. Uh, years ago, I read a book um, about research methodologies and how to do research within indigenous communities by uh, Linda Tukovoy Smith. And in that book, she talks, and I'm paraphrasing the, the, the book, but she talked about how it's really important when researchers are working within indigenous communities to remain accountable to that to the indigenous communities to give them some uh, latitude to shape the research question to uh, at the end of the day come back and share the findings with that community how important is it for you as a researcher who's black and as a researcher who's disabled to be accountable to the participants that you're working with and collaborating on and how do you achieve that accountability yeah so uh, as a, 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 like a, as, a, as a person as a researcher who is disabled, my aim is to be able to do whatever I can to be able to improve upon uh, children with disabilities like across the world. And I wouldn't want to see my papers uh, just published uh, in um, in journals that pe a lot of people with disabilities may not even be able to assess. So I'm open to kind of uh, using other non-traditional means to be able to get my uh, research uh, 
into the hands of the people who really matters, including people with disabilities and policymakers and then um and then service providers. So one of the key ways is to sit down with the community and then kind of find out where they access the their information from and how they would like the uh, information uh to be uh how they how they would want the information to be delivered to be make to make it more accessible to them. And then secondly to I wouldn't want to consider myself as an expert because as a um as a black uh, researcher from uh, Ghana, one of the things that really fascinates me is that I have lived with disability uh, for most of my life in uh, in Ghana, and yet I am not considered as like an aspect of my own lived experience. And then uh, uh, a white person comes from Canada, goes to uh, Ghana to study about disabilities, and all of a sudden, uh, the person is an aspect in 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 uh, disability issues in Africa, and I would would I wouldn't want my uh, the uh, people with disabilities to consider me as an extreme aspect. I'm, I just want them to see that like we are all on the same level. We all have different like experiences, and we all have like different uh, talents and abilities. Uh, that we we are bringing on the table to serve and uh, improve upon the uh, lives for uh, everybody and make our world a better place. Mm. Well, you said that so well. Um, I could wrap it up there, but I know you said you don't want to be considered an expert, but you are the inaugural Embark scientist, and you talked earlier in our conversation about setting up the Race, Ethnicity, and Disability Lab, or the Read Lab. Tell me, in the next couple of years, where you're hoping to take your research and what your research focus is going to be. Yeah, so in the next couple of years, um, I, I would like to see uh, like a lot of... Uh, uh, I would like to see enough uh, data, like on uh, enough research, uh, focusing on race and uh, disability, that the government and clinicians and community have got like enough data to work with, to plan policies, to plan uh, programs, to improve upon the lives of our uh, uh, people with disabilities, like all over, uh, all over, including racialized and non-racialized people with disabilities, and I also want to uh, see the continuation of uh, innovative, like research, uh, that's improving upon the lives of uh, people with disabilities, not just in Canada but internationally. Mm -hmm. Those connections are so important. Delorence, thank you so much for speaking to me today. It was a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you so much, and I enjoy my time with you. DeLorence Lamty is the inaugural scientist in the Embark program that is um, a part of some of the wonderful offerings from Holland Blurview Children's Rehab Center. Well, we're almost out of time today. I have to say that DeLorence has given me a lot to think about in terms of remaining accountable and thinking through some of the complexities of doing research as you, uh, as someone who's black, as someone who's an immigrant, as someone who is a person with a disability, not just the challenges, but the real genuine desire that you heard uh, where DeLoren says that he wants to give back to the disability community. I know I'll be thinking about this interview for a very long time. And I hope that if you have thoughts about the conversation I just had with DeLoren, you will reach out to us and share your thoughts. You can find us in a couple of different ways. You can always pick up the phone and give us a call. We love it when you call and leave us a voicemail. You can reach us at 1-866-509-4545. That's 1-866-509-4545. Don't forget to leave permission for us to play the audio on the program. If you'd rather, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, you can find Accessible Media Inc. on Facebook. The Pulse on AMI Audio also has a Facebook page. You can reach us there. Otherwise, if you still like to be on Twitter, you can find us on Twitter at AMI Audio. Use the hashtag Pulse AMI. If you want to look me up on Twitter, I'm at Chuita Gupta. However you'd like to get in touch with us, we would love to hear from you. Oh, I almost forgot. There's also an email address you can write to feedback at AMI.ca. So however you'd like to get in touch with us, we would love to hear from you. But this has been the second of a couple of shows dealing with 
different perspectives of being black and disabled in Canada. You heard from Tina Opalaki and her perspective as the parent of a child with a disability navigating the healthcare system. And today we were delighted, of course, to have Delorence Lamptey with us talking about the challenges and opportunities of being a black disabled researcher. We'll also be bringing forward an advocacy perspective, so I hope you look for that in a future program. But that's all the time we have for today. We've got to wrap up. It's been great to be with you today. The videographer for this episode of The Pulse is Matthew McGurk. Ryan Delahanty is podcast coordinator. Mark Aflalo is technical producer. And Andy Frank is the manager for AMI-audio. On behalf of everybody here, I've been your host, Chuita Gupta. Thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of your day.